I'm Walter Block. I'm Jody M. Reeves. This is Adam Kokesh. I'm Jeffrey Tucker. I'm Ben Swan. I'm Tom Wood. I'm Peter Schiff. I'm Eric Voorhees. And you're listening to... And you're listening... And you're listening to... You're listening... You're listening to... Ed and Ethan soak up the awesomeness. to Ed and Ethan, the voice of liberty in Canada, coming to you from Saskatoon in the province of Saskatchewan for the week of, uh, I don't even have my calendar up. What what week is it now? It's December 29th, 29th 2013. Yes. <laughs> I know that. I know how the calendar works. I know I insist every show that I do, and, and it doesn't seem like I do, but honestly, I do. Okay, my <laughs> incredible co-host is a guy that's going to say hello, the incredible Ed. Say hello to the world, Ed. Show off those those talents you've got. Yeah, it's Ed here. Awesomeness. Uh, yeah. Well, Merry Christmas. Okay, you know, you should, that's past. Uh, it, ha- yeah, Happy New Year. Happy New Year's, coming right yes. up here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, talents. <laughs> I said talents. We, you'll come up with them someday. Don't worry about it. You're listening, of course, to us on LibertyExpressRadio.com, and I should mention that I am your humble host, Ethan. Uh, LRN.FM. You can find us there in rotation as well, the Liberty Radio Network and Liberty Movement Radio. Check them out at 2LMR.com. And, of course, you can always look at what we have to offer at EdandEthan.com. Here you can find our RSS feed for your favorite podcasting aggregators, YouTube, Facebook, iTunes, all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. We spread over the internet like an octopus is huh. that is that no that, i don't i don't like uh. that i don't think i should have said that all right well anyway we'll we'll just leave it in there and then uh, i guess you know listeners will have to deal with it yeah we're not like the <laughs> nsa's logo on their new spy satellite oh the octopus, wasn't that hey? creepy yeah was it? it's uh i can't remember what it said but it's basically this this octopus we see all or something like yeah, that. yeah something like that we yeah. see all and it was an octopus that had its its tentacles around the world and that's going up on a spy satellite yeah. or has gone up huh. isn't that creepy you know talk about brazen uh-huh. Uh, anyhow, um, so, uh, okay, uh, bef- before we get on to, to our uh, our first segment, which, by the way, is going to feature a fantastic fellow, but we'll get to that in just a second. I want to remind our, our good friends out there, our wonderful, beautiful... Li- we return. You know, I feel like Gandalf today for some reason. I think uh, Mordor, uh, Mor- Gondor. Oh, God. That it's because I told you that stupid joke, isn't it? Now I have to <laughs> yeah. tell the audience. Okay, so there's a stupid thing where you look at a picture and it's got an illustration of a door. So that underneath it's caption a door. And then there's a picture of two doors and it says more door. Right. So if Lord of the Rings fans will know. And then there's a picture of no door and it says Gondor. Uh, which is, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, uh-huh. 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 That's a real knee slap. I, I smirked uh, <laughs> when you told it to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm replete with good jokes. Uh, good, quote unquote. So anyway, uh, the, the, the show, uh, this hour of the show, of course, is made possible by our friends at Regal Assets. If you want gold in your investment retirement or I- individual retirement account, your IRA, uh, you should visit gold.edandethan.com to see what our friends at Regal Assets do have to offer. Again, that's gold.edandethan.com. Don't forget that part. That's how we get paid. Yeah. Um, and of course, I, I really do think it's important if you do have an IRA, if that's the route that you're choosing to go and uh, preserve your uh, retirement income in the United States, you should be checking into putting precious metals into your IRA. Uh, if you look at how deflation has damaged the dollar, uh, it, it, look, look, I, I've said it before. If you've got stuff in your IRA, like stocks, the, all that kind of stuff, it, it's probably doing really well right now. All right. And, mm-hmm. and, and I'm very happy for you that all that Fed money, uh, that funny money has been pumped <laughs> into the stock markets. Good for you. But. But uh, you look into the future, you may just want to consider just how badly those things will do in comparison uh, to to gold. Uh, like if you want to preserve your purchasing power, precious metals are probably the way to do it. So check out gold.edandethan.com to find out how to put gold into your IRA. Um, now, all that aside, we have a special, wonderful treat for you. We haven't talked to this guy in a long time. And over feel, a year now, yeah. Has it been over a year? Yeah, it has. Wow. We're, we're going to... Look, it, th- that's that's a mistake on our part, but uh, we'll, we'll remedy that today. Uh, the person I am referring to, of course, is Stefan Kinsella. He's an intellectual property lawyer, a patent attorney, and of course, he is described as a reluctant patent attorney. He has <laughs> some issue with, uh, with uh, intellectual property laws, the concept of intellectual property. Um, so we'll bring him on the line now. Stefan, are you with us? I'm with you. Very glad to be here. Uh, guys, it's been about a, a while, but I've uh, I've heard you guys. I heard you're great. I think you had an interview with Stefan Molyneux, 
not too long ago that was great. Oh, well, gosh, I, I we we've had <laughs> when was that? That was a, that was like six months ago, I think. About it, Stefan Gonzalez or Stefan Molyneux was a while ago. I know we were we were co-hosting uh, Michael Dean's uh, show there. Uh, that yeah. was fun. So we had that. Yeah. That was good stuff. Peter yeah, Schiff you know. too. That was, that was cool. Peter <laughs> Schiff. Yeah. <laughs> Peter Schiff. We had fun with him. So uh, you know, we've had some interviews in the past little while. It's been a lot of fun. But and now. We add you to the lineup, so of course, finally, some quality comes on the air. Uh, <laughs> but we, I wanted, well, that's great. I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, the TPP, and this this is an agreement that is, uh, you know, it's been, uh, I guess, authored sort of in secret. Uh, it's been very difficult to to kind of figure out exactly what's going on with the TPP, uh, and there are some pretty nasty copyright provisions that have been leaked by WikiLeaks in the this uh, agreement. So, yay, WikiLeaks. Well, you know they're they're doing good work in that respect. So, Stefan, from your perspective, if we if we step back, can you give me kind of your idea of what the TPP is, what it represents to you? Well, sure. Um, first of all, let's step back and talk about the name of this thing. I mean, do you <laughs> notice the government, the state, has gotten really good in the last 30, 40 years at, at propaganda and at uh, window dressing? Mm. Um, if you remember, you know, 50, 60 years ago in the U.S., we, we called uh, our defensive establishment the Department of War. I mean, you know, there was no bones about it, right? It's the Department right. of War. <laughs> hmm. Now it's the Department of Defense. So. Over time, these agencies get more into um, you know, propaganda and window dressing, and they come up with these innocuous titles like Obamacare is the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> I mean, who's against affordable care? Right. <laughs> of course, it's not affordable, but you know, that's the title of the legislation. And so Trans-Pacific Partnership is one of these terms designed to sound – Vaguely cooperative, you know, it's a partnership. It's across the Pacific. We want free trade. No one knows what the details are. Um, the the way it's worked in the past, uh, say, century of international negotiations is that typically treaties between countries are negotiated in a regularly, a fairly public manner. But trade agreements, which are usually between two two nations are done in secret and then they're you know they approach their legislatures and then they can approve them um in recent years there's been an attempt by the states to basically take what's really a treaty which should be negotiated in public mm -hmm. uh, so that people can have input and be aware of what's going on and to cover it under the rubric of a free trade agreement so they can keep it secret that was done with the acta which has been temporarily defeated although i wouldn't count it is dead yet. That's the mm. uh, anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, which is very anti-free market. Um, look, when I was younger, I used to support these things called bilateral bilateral trade agreements, which you know two countries would, or, or even multilateral, they would agree we're going to all lower our trade barriers, right? So basically, it's a, it's an approach towards free trade is is what is how they're carried. Like NAFTA, right. for example, we talked about NAFTA earlier. Um, the thing is, of course, the, the natural libertarian view is just have unilateral free trade. You, you, one government should just totally drop its barriers. You shouldn't condition that upon another country doing something. But at least if both countries lower their trade barriers, it's a good thing. But that would only take about a page of text or less. I, mean, I could draft it in probably one sentence very easily. But it, it's usually a thousand pages, which means it's a type of managed trade. They have to accommodate the unions and the – the socialists and the welfareists and the environmentalists and everything like that. So these things usually are a mixed bag. But one thing they are is the United States primarily, you know, the, the big de democratic powerful bully on the block, <laughs> basically uses its power to extract free trade concessions from other countries. Um, well, to grant free trade status, so-called free trade status. And they, but they say, but you have to agree to our IP standards, our intellectual property standards. Mm. So the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, which has been leaked a couple of times recently by WikiLeaks and related groups. I think your Michael Geist up in Canada is one of the heroic so – he's like a lawyer WikiLeak kind of guy. Mm -hmm. He's not completely with us on everything, but he, he's at least for kind of openness and transparency and uh, getting information out there that we can review. Um, the TPP is an agreement that has been being negotiated in secret for several years now among about a dozen key nations, U.S., uh, others. The thing is the free trade provisions 
it would enact or not that you know significantly better than what we already have but basically it uh it uni- it tries to make uniform certain provisions and and to get these other countries to agree to it, it they say you have to expand your intellectual property protection so really it's just an excuse to expand and to export american style intellectual property which i call intellectual property imperialism mm-hmm. um, to the rest of the world it's imperialist because, to be honest, the only country who it really benefits is the United States. Almost every other country on a net basis term is harmed by the adoption of U.S.-style IP law, copyright and patent. Um, but we're, they, they do it because the U.S. twists their arms, and we have the power to influence them, at least for now. And um, it's for the benefit of the pharmaceutical industry, the software industry – the um, the music industry and the movie industry in America. So basically, the entire world legal and cultural landscape and tr- free trade landscape has been distorted and is being increasingly distorted because of these three or four industries in the U.S. Oh, isn't that awful? I, Sounds I, like big government, yeah. But it's a failure of capitalism, I think, Ed, yeah. is, is really what's going on here, right? That's that's the problem. Yeah, it, really, <laughs> it really bugs me because free trade, they, they put that word in there, and then people think that free trade is the problem. And it's like, well, so what's is, the alternative to free trade? Protectionism? You, you know, that that trade? was the, our, our friend Daniel Benoit at Liberty Beat, uh, uh, the Liberty Beat Canada podcast, he, he, he described this beautifully. He said, if, uh, trade agreements, just uh, as a notion, don't make any sense because that's not what governments are doing. You know, a trade agreement is when I order, you know, a, a replacement print head from my print for my printer from Hong Kong, and I, I give them money and they mm-hmm. give me a print head in the post. Right? That's a trade agreement. But what governments do is is they're agreeing to trade laws. Right? So mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll trade your law mm-hmm. for this law, mm-hmm. and 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 we're gonna we're gonna, so they're they're really it's really a, a legal agreement. It's more it's more they're agreeing to uh, to change the legal landscape. It's not really a trade agreement at all. It's it's a kind of a misnomer and you know uh, Stefan, you mentioned uh, how these acts are, are all called, uh, you know, really nice things. The window dressing, like the Affordable Care Act. Don't get me started it's, on the Patriot Act. Yeah, it's usually the opposite. <laughs> it's usually yeah, what that, it is that, that's a good opposite. with the Patriot Act, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, or you the, know. Or the, or the recent patent legislation under Obama two years ago in America called the America Invents Act. The, sorry, yeah. could you repeat that? It's called the America Invents Act. That was <laughs> Obama's patent reform legislation, which basically made patent law worse and, in my view, reduced invention and innovation. But it's called the America Invents Act. And who's against America inventing? Yeah, shucks. I love inventing. And as long yeah. as there's legislation out there to encourage inventing, it must be a good thing. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get into, because the, the, the Trans-Pacific Par- Partnership, when it comes to intellectual property, is indeed uh, a big, scary beast. There's a lot in there that uh, was leaked by WikiLeaks, and, and you pointed out to us earlier uh, off air that, you know, we don't even know what's in the current draft. I mean, because yep. this stuff just, as you mentioned, happens in secrecy, uh, you know, your account Accountable elected Democratic representatives, huh. of course, are here for you, even though they're not going to tell you what the <laughs> heck they're doing. Uh, I just love the concept. But anyway, um, so uh, we get into there's a lot of uh, IP stuff in the agreement that was uh, in the draft that was leaked. Um, you mentioned something about a case uh, uh, to me about Eli Lilly and Eli Lilly was suing a company up here in Canada. Mm. Um and this was because of NAFTA. And I, I, could you tie that together with the TPP? Sure. Sure. So Na- NAFTA is a good example of what we can expect to see from um, the TPP and the ACTA and other things that are coming up. Uh, NAFTA, everyone thinks of it as a free trade agreement, um, and it has been successful in some ways. Mm. But it requires each country, you know, Mexico, U.S., and Canada, to respect certain minimum norms of IP protection, which, by the way, go beyond all these treaties – that Canada and Mexico has already have already agreed to in the past decades at U at the U S insistence like WIPO and GATT and TRIPS. I mean, it's just <laughs> unbelievable all the acronyms. But um, so NAFTA requires minimum protections for patents, and Canada, of course, has a regular modern Westernized um, patent system. But mm-hmm. it's not going to be the same in application as the U S or other countries. And Eli Lilly applied for a patent on one of their pharmaceuticals and was denied the patent, which happens from time to time. And normally what you would do is if you apply for a patent and you're denied, you can go through the the local appeals process and you basically either 
get your patent or you don't. Well, they, they were denied the patent, although I think they got a similar patent in other countries. And what they said was uh, Canada, the Canada Patent Department's denial of their patent, even though it followed Canada's rules, was in violation of the NAFTA agreement and therefore the Canadian government. So they sued the Canadian government uh. for $500 million <laughs> of lost profits that they could have <laughs> obtained. So in other words, we, you didn't give us the tool to extort our, our competitors in Canada – so you have to make it up to us. So because you have this regular ability to, to extort the taxpayers, just take the taxpayers' money and give it to us. So that's just an example of what we can expect if we start. So so let me just give you a snapshot of what the TPP does, really. Mm. Okay, it doesn't really increase free trade that much. The the main thing is the IP chapter. And by the way, this thing may be passed pretty soon. We don't know right now what they're going to do, although. There's hope that with the increasing skepticism of IP and the way that SOPA was defeated, maybe there's a um, – um, and with WikiLeaks exposing what's going on, maybe there's going to be um, uh, a chance to slow this thing down or stop it. But So it does a couple things. Number one, it seeks to increase copyright terms by another 20 years to meet the U.S. standard or even further. So for example, in the U.S., we adopted the Sonny Bono copyright uh, term extension act mm -hmm. about 15 years ago which is called the mickey mouse protection act by some people <laughs> um and and by the way that extended the protection that's required by the burn convention this international treaty that canada and other countries adhere to by 20 years so we're like life of the author plus 70 years so we're talking a good 100 plus years wow. canada i think it's life plus 50 right now so canada is more similar to the other countries who adhere to the minimum burn convention standards the u.s wants to use the tpp to get everyone to agree to extend copyright by another 20 years some people speculate that this is because of the beatles because the beatles work is starting to fall out of copyright in england you know their home country Whereas it's still covered in the U.S. for another 20 years because of the Sonny Bono Act. So basically this is an attempt to twist the arms of other countries to extend their copyright terms by 20 more years or more. So that's one provision. The other would be to extend these U.S. rules on anti-circumvention technology, which is called the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So one effect of that would be that it's actually – a a federal crime or, or a state crime um, to unlock your cell phone, okay? Um, oh. Even though the Library of Congress in the U.S. had just had her arm twisted recently to try to temporarily relax those rules, but it's going to revert back to what it was a couple of years ago where if you buy a piece of hardware and you use it as you see fit, even if it's not a violation of copyright, even if there's a fair use exception for you to use your property in that way, it would still be a violation of these anti-circumvention provisions and be a crime punishable with jail time, which is the case right now in the U.S. and which they're seeking to export to Canada and other countries by the TPP. Um, another one is there's been a long um, uh, ignored provision of copyright law where after like 35 years, there's a way that authors can seek to renegotiate the, the assignment of their rights that they gave to publishers – and get their rights back so that they can re free their their books and their and their their screenplays and things like this. That will be scrapped under the TPP. Um, I mean, there's just a, a litany of things like this that are just basically ratcheting up. And, oh, also, also, um, <laughs> the worst thing to be honest is this. Let let me explain quickly about a quirk of the U.S. law which gave rise to the internet which was the, the D Digital Millennium Copyright Act. There was a compromise done. This was like 1995, 1998, before the Congress and the lobbyists and all these critters realized what they were doing. They negotiated this thing called a safe harbor, which is that if an ISP, basically someone who has a channel like YouTube or a, a blog engine, if someone is using their service to post content that ends up being defamatory or having a copyright infringement, the host is not liable so long as they take certain reasonable measures to respond to complaints. This is called the DMCA takedown system. Okay, mm. But the point is it gave a safe harbor, and it didn't make the host liable. If not for that little quirk in the law, which by the way, the entire entertainment industry in the US now is fighting, and they want to get it repealed, Okay, and so do some free market think tanks. 
like the Fraser Institute in Canada and other so-called free market groups. It's incredible. Um, if not for that, we wouldn't have had what we see now, Facebook, YouTube. They would be totally unviable business models. So the, the SOPA Act that was defeated seek to overturn that sort of safe harbor or reverse the burden of proof and to make the ISPs the copyright police. Okay, which basically is a bit too much of an undue burden on them. So the TPP seeks to extend that to both the U.S. and the rest of the world, and it is just the first step or one of the first steps in, in basically shutting down internet freedom and giving the, the – basically the police in every country the right to go in. In fact, Italy just passed a law a couple of days ago saying that the government has the right under its regulatory agencies to just go in and totally shut down an entire website with only 12 days notice and no due process review if there's a suspicion of copyright infringement. Um, so basically we, we have an increasing amount of, of, of chilling and quashing of internet freedom in the name of copyright. And this is one of the um, – this, this, this horrible agreement is one, of the, is one of the chief threats to ratchet that type of um state control of the internet up this, this is i have a question that's kind of off topic of the tpp but did you hear about this uh the the, the patent trolls trying to go after podcasters because we've yes. got a, we've got a commercial <laughs> <laughs> we've got a, you, you've heard about this yes could, could you just kind Absolutely. of talk about that a little bit maybe absolutely <laughs> so a, a patent troll is a derogatory term. <laughs> Ironically, it was come up with by the guy that founded Intellectual Ventures, which is now one of the biggest patent trolls. So this guy was, uh, I think, Peter Detkin, if I'm remembering the name right. If not, uh, I hope it's not um, a problem, but <laughs> we can research this. He was with Intel or someone, and he was like defending companies from uh, patent assaults. And he started getting upset with all the assaults his company was being hit with, and he, he came up with the term patent troll. <laughs> well, later he formed Intellectual Ventures and acquired tons of patents, and all they do is go around asserting patents, and that's the classic patent trolling thing. A patent troll means someone – it's like the idea of a troll, someone who – a big monster who sits at a bridge and takes a troll <laughs> before he can pass. <laughs> but if you think about it, basically that's just what the, the IRS is, right? That's uh -huh. what taxation is. Yeah. It's just a tax on innovation. It's a tax on the free market. And it's bad. I don't like it. But honestly, it's not the problem, and it's not as big of a problem as the regular patent users like Apple, Samsung, um, these companies that actually are not trolls because their patents cover their technology, and they use them to stop competition. So their goal is not to get a royalty from someone or to just take a little tax to wet their beak, as the mafia might say. Mm. Right, they actually want to use the power of the courts to get an injunction to stop competition, and this is what creates oligopolies and cartels and uh, walled gardens and uh, barriers to entry and reduced competition, higher prices for consumers, reduced innovation, um, etc. So, mm. everyone focuses on these little issues that they can maybe fix a little bit instead of the fundamental issue. It's like saying we should switch from a income tax to a sales tax or whatever you know the government never wants to lower the damn rates yeah. that would be the solution to any tax is lower the rates but they don't want to do that so they just distract you by saying we're going to change the form of the tax well this is what they do with the patent system they don't focus on the main issue which is that the patent system reduces competition they say well we need to reduce the abuse of the system by patent trolls <laughs> so there's a recent bill introduced in the u.s <laughs> congress to um I forgot. The, it's another one of these euphemistic names, which sounds mm -hmm. good, but it's ridiculous. And it, the purpose is to promote um, innovation by slightly reducing the abuses of the system by trolls, um, like making them pay the lawyer's fees if they lose a case, um, You know, a few cosmetic changes like that. And by the way, this is what's disheartening to me. Like Richard Epstein, who I admire, who's a great free market advocate, who's a Cato scholar… He has an article in, in some recent Forbes or something saying that this law would totally ruin innovation. <sighs> so you have this pro-pharmaceutical patent. <laughs> By the way, the Cato Institute and Richard Epstein and Doug Banda, some of these guys years ago, they were against the free trade, what's called drug reimportation, 
you guys may have heard this, you know, uh, Bayer and these other companies sell, sell pharmaceuticals in Canada, let's say, and they mm. sell them at a lower price than the monopoly patent price in the U.S. because the Canadian government, although it grants a patent, also has price controls on drugs. So mm -hmm. it's sort of like a socialist uh, KO. They, they sort of let you charge a higher price because of the patent monopoly, but then they don't let you abuse it. In any <laughs> case, people would buy the drugs and bring them back to the U.S., and they, they satisfy the FDA regulations because they were already approved. They're not a knockoff. They're actually made by the U.S. manufacturer. They're not a patent infringement because there's an implicit license if you buy a, a drug made by them. But so the only thing you do is go get the FTC to block it on free trade grounds. And you had um, Epstein and other guys opposing free trade, opposing what they call <laughs> drug reimportation because it would undermine the patent monopoly. I mean it's just incredible <sighs> how this whole IP <laughs> issue corrupts people that otherwise are liberal or free market-minded um, People. I got off on a little tangent there, so I'll well, that's okay, start. Stephen. It was a beautiful yeah. tangent. I yeah. mean, here's it, you know, it's funny because you you're throwing all these things around. Trips, Acta, uh, NAFTA, of course. You you've got. I mean, I'm I'm expecting unicorns and gummy bears act 2.0 or something. <laughs> I don't know what's next, but um, and uh, you. you I, I think that what you're touching on here is something that does deserve a little bit more conversation. I mean, we don't have a whole lot of time, but let's let's go after it anyway. Uh, I've never been one to respect the clock. Um, let, let's uh, let's let's talk specifically about you know that uh, innovation uh, and and its supposed protection by by uh, patent and uh, intellectual property because um, what we have. And I think a lot of uh, a lot of uh, very libertarian folks uh, have a a deep respect for patent law because you know you have somebody that say makes their living from snapping pictures right, um, and they sell those pictures and and somebody like me could just rip it off the web and and use it for my own purposes and and not even credit them perhaps and mm -hmm. and use it for whatever I want I, I may even make money with it so uh, I guess you know some people have a real problem with that. Concept, and I, I personally don't. Uh, I don't mind if somebody uses, you know, any of the any of the uh, uh, stuff that we uh, produce here at Ed and Ethan. If they want to use it for uh, for profit, I don't have a problem with that. But a lot of people do, especially if it's their if it's their livelihood, their their you know what they're bringing home to to feed themselves, their family, whatnot. So, how do you, in a more broad sense, Stefan, how do you uh, deal with those objections when somebody says, "Look, this is my livelihood; it needs to be protected." Right, right. right. You know, how do you address that? It's difficult because people have a different mindset now because of the system that we're working in that we're used to. Right? It's like saying you're against welfare or you're against socialized medicine. People think that. They think that you're saying you're you're for people dying in the streets mm -hmm. because they're so used to that being the the way that you solve these these issues, and they've been told for over a hundred years that um, part of the free market, well the free market is good, property rights are good, and that patent and copyright are intellectual property rights, right? Mm -hmm. But you know if you think about it, anyone who starts a new business is afraid of competition. If you're very the more successful you are. The more of a profit signal you're going to broadcast into the market and let people know, hey, I found a way to satisfy consumers. You should come compete with me and try to do the same thing. And when they do that, when they respond to these Hayekian, Austrian, you know, free market signals, then competition increases and it becomes more difficult to make a profit and your profit erodes and you have to keep innovating. This is actually what we free market people used to be in favor of. <laughs> it's called competition. Hmm. But for some reason, uh, people have a blind spot about IP because of propaganda and the and the fallacious notion that you can, um, you know, own information. I mean, you used the word ripoff earlier. Mm -hmm. Ripoff is a synonym for theft, or mm -hmm. taking, or stealing, or robbery, or piracy. But these these metaphors and these ideas have to do with with real conflict in the world where someone literally removes one of your resources from you without your permission. It makes you worse off. But that's not what happens when someone copies something you've done or they emulate you or they uh, compete with you. Um, by the way, on a quick aside on these acronyms, and I won't go into detail here, but I did I, – I'm a lawyer, but I hate you know trying to rely in my arguments on some kind of arcane expertise, although <laughs> it's my experience that basically only 
patent lawyers understand what I'm talking about um, <laughs> in, in details, <laughs> which is fine and, and which is good. But people that favor IP should at least know what they're talking about, and they usually don't. I have a post on C4SIF.org from a year or so ago, and I call it Death by Copyright IP Fascist Police State Acronym. And I just collect <laughs> – I don't even collect the laws that don't have a good acronym. I just leave those out, and there's like three dozen here. There's like uh, – just look at them. It's unbelievable. It's NIR, PRCC, IPEC, ACTA, CEDA, SOPA, PIPA, IPPA, <laughs> the OPEN Act, the RWA, which is the Research Works Act, the TPP, the PCIP, the ITU, the CISPA. You know, it's, it's DMCA, the Patriot Act. Of course, that's an acronym. The NET Act, you know. Uh, it, so it, they use these acronyms all the time, and it's just unbelievable how they want to baffle people with – I don't want to use a, a curse word, but baffle people with BS, right? Um, and make them think the experts are the ones who are going to, you know, to take care of this. Just trust us. Sure. Well, I mean that, that's something that that's something that really always struck me as odd too. Is you, you get all of these, you, you get this this myriad of of uh, legalese uh, terms, right? You, you just it's it, it's incredibly overwhelming. You get the avalanche of law, and then you're told, you know, this is a community standard communication. This this is this is the the government working out mm-hmm. how we how we communicate normally. Oh my gosh, how on earth can that possibly be called community standards? It's ridiculous to even think. Think that that that's a, a something that is just normal communication between people, and, and you know when it when it gets right down to it, I, I look at intellectual property. I I really do respect the feeling of some people who who yeah. are trying to use it to defend uh, what they right. do, but when it gets right down to it. This is a sort of right that cannot possibly exist without monopolized government control of law. And if, if there is a right that exists by virtue of, of being granted uh, in, in the mm-hmm. face of monopolized government control, I don't think that's a natural right. If, if, if you're looking at a right and you're saying the only way for this right to exist is for the government to have a monopoly of, of law, and, and and that and that it, uh, it it cannot exist in a competitive free market environment. I think you're looking at something that's not a natural right. I, I don't know, Stefan. Mm-hmm. Would you say that's that's an accurate and apropos description? I think, I, I think that's exactly right. In fact, so what I would say is that um, um, the uh, the proponents of IP are sort of schizophrenic or dishonest or dissembling on this issue because. They want to call it a right and a property right because that's their propaganda technique. They've been using mm. this for the last 70 years. It, originally, these were just called privileges. I mean the copyright um, law we have now basically originated in modern form in the U.S. Constitution and the original U.S. Copyright Act, but that was based upon the statute of Anne in, in 1709 in England, which was a response to the <laughs> Stationers Guild, the Stationers Company – which was an explicit church-state um, mechanism to censor, uh, you know, Protestant thought or whatever. Huh. And the patent system originated again in the U.S. Constitution, but that had its origins in the statute of, wait for it, monopolies of 16, 1623 in England. They they explicitly called it the statute of monopolies. What what you had happening was. You had mercantilism and protectionism. You had the king, mm. the crown, the granting basically monopoly privileges to favored court cronies, usually to induce them to help collect taxes. So I'll give you the monopoly on sheepskin. You're the only guy that can export sheepskin at this harbor because I'm the king. I own the country. I can say who <laughs> uses my harbor. Mm. So I'll give you a monopoly. That's gonna You can make tons of money if you're the only guy people can buy sheepskin legally from, right? But in exchange, you're going to have to help me collect taxes. Um, or there was, you know, you're the only guy that can sell playing cards in in the in the stores mm. in this in in the city of London. And on occasion, we will help you enforce this by sending the king's goons just to march into people's faci- businesses, like it's a violation of the you know not the Fourth Amendment but private property rights, and just mm. search their car- playing cards and make sure they have the king's seal and stamp on them. <laughs> so this is pure, pure, complete mercantilism and protectionism, and it was literally called the Statute of Monopolies. Now, the Statute of Monopolies actually improved matters because it wanted to get rid of the king's arbitrary authority 
to grant all these just random monopoly privilege grants. But that statute made an exception. They said, we're going to get rid of all these monopolies, except for inventions. The king can still grant those. <laughs> so now we have – and that morphed into the modern patent system. And mm. it's just bizarre that libertarians are, are praising and worshiping the modern remnants of mercantilism and censorship and praising them as the heart and root of capitalism, which Ayn Rand and the objectivists do mm -hmm. and a lot of utilitarian libertarians. Um, it is really, in a way, the one of the worst of the libertarian mistakes because, you know, unlike the drug war or regular war or taxation, which most libertarians, if you think about it, can recognize as there's a little tension there between that and private property and liberty, mm. <laughs> right? They at least know there's a tension. But when you call something a property right, then they sort of think, well, I don't know how to reconcile these things, but the experts can do it. Mm, yeah. So, so I, I agree with you, by the way, to get back on the track. The, the, there's nothing wrong with creators and entrepreneurs having pride in their intellectual creativity and, and what they've created. And there's – and I won't say there's nothing wrong with it, but it's understandable that, that people don't like competition and they want to take advantage of whatever legal – protections they have to stop people from competing with them but that doesn't mean that that's what the law should be yeah yeah no i i i, I thank you so much for for you know drawing out and illustrating these points it's fascinating mm -hmm. to have mm -hmm. uh, your perspective to inform us because um you know like i said i i really do respect that a lot of people do as you say Stefan, take pride in their intellectual works and you know but but using this language to obscure uh, where where it is we're deriving rights from, you know, to say that you know this idea is me mixing my intellectual labor with oh, with, my, with my with my work, yeah. you know. And this kind of thing to try and make it into a right, I don't buy it. And 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 with with due respect to those out there who do who do make a, a, a wonderful living from their intellectual works, uh, I, I I don't think that uh, just because you make a living from something means that you then get a right to make it exclusive. That seems to me mm -hmm. uh, very wrong. Stefan, listen, uh, we've long ago we ran out of time, but I I appreciate you uh, taking the time today to be with us, and we need to do this more often. It was it was yes. a lot of fun to have you on. I'd be happy to. You guys are, are great hosts, and I've enjoyed your show, and uh, I'd be happy to be on any time. And, uh, uh, hey, listen. Carry, it, it, carry on. Absolutely. Carry on. I, I appreciate the praise and uh, from such a wonderful source. Thanks again, Stefan. We'll, we'll hook up again soon. It's, uh, it's great to talk to you. Thank you. Stefan Ginselli is the founder and director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom, C4SIF, or you can find him at Stefan Kinsella. Dot com. That's S-T-E-P-H-A-N Kinsella, K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A dot com. Um, an absolute pleasure. It has been a crazy awesome show with uh, Jeffrey mm. in the front, and we've got, we got uh, you know, I could talk to Stefan for ages. Yeah, man. <laughs> he just, he goes off, and it's, everything he says just is like, it's brilliant. Absolutely. It makes total sense. So, all right, that's everything that we've got for you today right here on the Liberty Express Radio Network on the Ed Neeson Show. So continue listening for more great content. Yeah, I pulled out my Tony the Team Tiger impression there. Uh, you can visit us at edneathan.com. Uh, tweet at us at Ed Neathan on Twitter. Uh, feedback at edneathan.com if you want to write us. As I say, stay tuned. This is Ed Neathan. Ed Neathan.